Welcome to the Alternative Investment Podcast. I'm Andy Hagens, and today we're talking about private equity and a unique private equity approach from a very unique family office. Joining me today is Rami Cassis. Rami, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for making the time. And, you know, b- before we even get into private equity, you know, anyone who comes on with a family office, that's always where it starts. It's always so interesting, you know, if it, and I don't, you know, DJ Van Curren, uh, we've had him on the show. He has very specific rules for if you consider yourself a family office or not. But I would okay. say as someone who's not a family office, I think it's something a lot of us aspire to, right? So we always want to hear how did it happen? Uh, how did you come to you know be operating in your own family office? Right. Um, I'll probably start off by saying I am not the traditional family office. And I'm happy to talk about what a family office typically looks like. But in answer to your immediate question about how I how I came to to build up my own family office, really, I, I've I've developed, I've built enough assets over the the period of time that I've worked that I have been working. I'm 54 this year, um, to have acquired a number of assets that I have the autonomy to run, and to continue to do more deals using my own funds. And one of the things that differentiates family offices from other investment vehicles is that they tend to use their own funds only um, and have the autonomy to decide for themselves how to manage those funds. But the the very short uh, answer is I've been working in 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 a private equity type environment using my own funds for about 15 years. And over time, I've managed to to build up enough assets, as I said, and liquidity to be able to to call Parabellum Investments my own family office, even if it's on the on the very lower end of the scale in terms of family offices, they start at around $100 million in assets mm-hmm. and they go up to um, several billions, as you know. Yeah, that's funny that you and I are aligned exactly on that because I referenced DJ Van Curren. He's founder of the Family Office Real Estate Institute. He references, well, $250 million is like his, his point. I'm like, well, maybe, but internally... We all kind of feel like, you know, personally, at least a hundred million, that's a pretty big deal, right? Like if I, if I get to the point where I'm managing a hundred million in private equity money, um, I think I'm going to call myself a family office at that point. So not, not to argue with DJ, but I'm actually with you, Rami. Like for me, I'm going to agree with that as a threshold. What's your background though? I guess managing assets is your background in real estate or is it in operating businesses? Uh, not at all. There's probably quite a lot to talk about, Andy, just to, to clarify. But so my, I started life, um, I studied engineering and mathematical physics, and I worked in industry for about 15 years. So I worked in oil and gas for 10 years with a company called Schlumberger. And that took me all over the world. Then I got out of oil and gas and worked in business advisory with KPMG on the business consultancy side. Then I went back into line management with Atos, where I led uh, Atos in the UK and part of Europe. So the first 15 years of my working life were spent in industry and were really the the foundational years that taught me how to run a business, how to run a P&L, how to lead teams and how to lead businesses. Then in 2008, I resigned from uh, corporate employment and um, did my first deal. And it it was a tiny business in the North of England that was scanning checks and those old credit card vouchers we used to have before a chip and pin. Uh, and that was a business with 15 employees. And it was turning over about a million dollars and losing 300K. I remember it vividly. I spent quite a lot of time uh, turning the business around. And then I managed to grow it by acquisition over the course of the coming years. And so if you fast forward my professional, my working life in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, it has been buying lower mid-market firms in a variety of sectors, enterprise software, um, medical services, pharma tech, uh, potentially mining, uh, and acting as the chairman, overseeing and supporting the CEOs of seven businesses, all in different sectors, all with their own management team, with a view to, um, to scaling these companies and driving organic growth at the same time. So that's the, I'm going to pause there if that's, that's already been quite a long answer. Well, no, it's interesting. And I think I, you know, it's like private equity. And I know that's something we're going to talk about today. 
has can have a little bit of an image problem. It never has with me though, because some deals go well, some deals go not well. But you know, broadly speaking, there's always change in the economy. There's always companies growing. There's always companies going bankrupt. Companies yeah. hiring. Companies doing layoffs. To me, private equity is almost beside the point. Like you know. People might look for scapegoats in certain situations or whatever, but private equity to me is it's a combination of capital and entrepreneurship because the capital part comes, you know, for you to buy a company or invest in a company to be a chairman, like obviously you need the capital to go out and, and acquire a company and you don't want to acquire something too small. It's not really a big enough playground, so to speak. But then the entrepreneurial half is you're not just buying a company you're unlocking value, right? Because if that company was totally successful, totally optimized as is, you wouldn't buy it as, you know, it's almost like, like with flipping houses or it's almost like a makeover. It's like, you see the potential. And so you, you purchase a company, but then you also enhance or enhance the operations. You unlock value with your entrepreneurship. Do you think that, is that the right way to look at private equity? That's the way I look at it. I think it's. It, I think it's a very healthy way of looking at private equity, um, and we should we should talk about the differences between private equity and family offices in the main, um, and 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 where I kind of see what what I'm doing being slightly different to, to either. The fundamentals of private equity are exactly as you described. The practical issues of private equity is that it is an industry dominated by a certain profile of individuals, typically ten people with, with either banking, accounting, or legal backgrounds. All of those professions are entirely admirable, but they tend to look at ways, they, they tend to focus uh, looking at businesses under a certain type of lens. And I think what private equity could do with is greater professional diversity in the types of roles and the background of, of individuals who work within those firms. Because... Um, it is very much focused on the numbers and on forecasting and, and uh, a lot of market study, which is perfectly sensible. But what it often lacks is real life. What, what private equity often lacks, I think, is real life experience in, in walking into a difficult meeting with a client or having to deal with, a, with an employee dispute or being able to, to relate and empathize with the employees of the firm that are your, one of your portfolio companies. Private equity will typically tend to say, well, we'll leave that up to the managers. But more often than not, the CEOs um, need some affirmation. They will, all, they will always invariably need some kind of support because managing a CEO or developing a CEO. It's lonely. Is it's lonely, right? I mean, that's where a chairman like yourself or a, a board, because there's no one beside you on the yeah. work chart. And so the pressure... Honestly, the pressure and stress of that job is enormous. I have to say that. Absolutely, Andy. And you, just as just as any management team has strengths and weaknesses, same applies to a CEO. We look at CEOs as, as if they're these all-knowing individuals. And CEOs typically tend to move up to that role either through sales or operations. And uh, for what it's worth, my background has been operations, which makes me particularly strong in some areas and not quite as strong in others. CEOs need development in just the same way that management teams do. And providing the CEO with that level of support and guidance is something that is lacking because private equity tends to typically manage through board meetings. Um, the answer is not always, let's make another investment or let's do another acquisition because often these acquisitions, if they're not properly integrated, made the company look like a green-eyed monster. And um, there's also a human element to both a CEO and the employees who know that a company is private equity backed, they will also know that the business is going to come back to the market for sale in three, four or five years. Mm -hmm. And it's quite destabilizing for employees. It's just as destabilizing for clients. And uh, that timeline, often dictated by LPs, as you know, being one yourself, um, drives a lot of the behaviors of CEOs and management teams as they get towards the latter stages of the three to five year. Uh, well, I, I want to pause. I want to pause you there. That's there's so much to unpack there, but one really interesting thread. Well, well, first of all, I'm not the target market uh, 
that private equity is a bad guy. I was thinking before we recorded, you know, I was looking through my notes in preparation and I was like, you know, thinking about private equity having an image problem. And I, I acknowledge it kind of does, but I was thinking it does it with me. And I remembered there was this book I read and I think I read it in like eighth or ninth grade. It was called Barbarians at the Gate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the, the KKR takeover of uh, Nabisco. Yeah, and I never saw it. It was based on a movie, right? But I never saw the movie. But I read that book in literally eighth or ninth grade, some uh, whatever, 13, 14, 15 years old. Yeah. And like even at that age, I was thinking, well, this is kind of cool. Well, you know, number one, it has the drama, right? It's like cor corporate warfare, hostile takeover, you know, all that kind of verbiage. Like as a young man, that's kind of exciting. But I, even, even at that age, I think I kind of understood there's an issue with large corporations, just like in government, any large organization with alignment of incentives or misalignment of incentives. And the fact of the matter is at many, many organizations, incentives are not well aligned, correctly in line. And, and maybe some of that is um, some of that is just intrinsic, right? An incentive for an employee will never be the same exact incentive as a business owner. Yeah. But broadly speaking, I like the idea of private equity coming in and helping to align incentives because a lot of even today, like even in, in the United States, at least a lot of our major corporations, sometimes their executive team, they're being motivated by um, being popular or being fashionable or being applauded by the media. Yeah. And it's, it's not in the interest of shareholders and there's more, obviously there's more stakeholders since it's the shareholders, but I guess I just broadly, I don't have a problem with someone identifying an asset or company and saying this is being mismanaged, or at least it's it's not reaching its full potential and and coming in and buying it and trying to restructure it. But one interesting thing that you said was just the the private equity, uh, the the thought that everyone is thinking they're only going to be here for three months and then they're going to flip this five. company or excuse me, three years yeah, and yeah, then they're going to sell the company again. That does create a lot of psychological toll. But with a family office, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I've done private equity deals and eight years later, I'm still owning it and I'll be happy to own it another 30 years. You know, I'm thinking one deal in particular. So is it, does private equity always have to be that kind of a flip or are there family offices doing these kind of deals where they're unlocking value and then they want to own the asset for the long term? Well, um, there's a couple of questions you raised there. So does does private equity always have to be a three to five year hold? Probably not. But more often than not, that's the that's the time horizon dictated by LPs, by the, their, their investors. VCs, we should come back to, we should discuss briefly. I think have a healthier approach to that, incidentally, because I think they're, they're prepared to hold on for longer, but they're also prepared to cut loose some of their poorly performing investments. Whereas wow. private equity, as you probably know, Andy, will be less likely to have a bad sale because it impacts their next fundraising round. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to crystallize a loss um, by selling it on the open market. And it's easier to, to, to mark the market the valuation on a quarterly basis, which is what most PE firms do, and somehow embellish the, the valuation of, of an asset that, that might be probably worth a little bit less. I've heard that that can happen, Rami. I've heard there could be a little embellishment of valuations. I like yes. that. <laughs> so crystallizing the loss is never great for your next roadshow. Now, on the family office, uh, which I'm probably not an expert on either, but from what I know of family offices, there's a few characteristics. Firstly, it's their own money rather than an, in an investor's money. So that means something, I think, both emotionally and in terms of the focus it brings to mind for those individuals deploying money. The problem is that the overwhelming majority of family officers have a remit of not losing money. Mm. You know, there's an old saying that it takes two generations to lose the wealth that was made by their great grandparents. Mm -hmm. More often than not, family officers are there to preserve the wealth generated by a generation and ensuring that it's still there two or three generations down the road. The problem with that is that, firstly, it's a great burden on the on the subs of the children of, of subsequent generations because they either forgive my language up the wall 
or are so paralyzed about losing it that they end up putting it into German bonds or US bonds or something. But their, their approach and attitude to risk is fundamentally different. Mm. Precisely because the mandate is, well, I can hold on to this asset for a long time, um, but I don't want to take any risk about, I don't want to take the risk of losing it. And uh, it drives a much more defensive behavior yeah. that is in many ways on the opposite end of, of where private equity and certainly VCs are. So I don't know if I answered your question there, Randy, because I feel I was rambling a little well, bit. Well, no, but... no, no. I, I liked it a lot. But I guess my my point was, to me, you know, when we're talking about like an LBO fund or certain types of private equity funds, to me, private equity is larger than that, right? Like I, I invested, purchased a, a portion of a business, you know, six or seven years ago. We didn't take on any debt. We just did a deal. And to me, that's private equity. It's, I mean, it's not... It's not a huge deal, but it's not it's not a stock, it's not a bond, it's a private yeah. deal. And so, you know, if I look at private equity in that very broad lens, and you know, we are kind of talking, you know, technically speaking, venture capital is part of private equity. Right. So to me, part of this makeover, this public image makeover needs to be private equity is much more than a leveraged buyout fund with a three year hold. I mean, that maybe it's the most no notorious part of private equity, but there's many other types of private equity. I, I completely agree with you. And fundamentally, doing a deal, whether it's VC, private equity, or family office, they're all nuances of the fundamentally, of fundamentally the same thing. Mm -hmm. But where the difference lies is, is, the invest, is in the investment style and behavior of the, of the individuals managing the investment. Mm -hmm. Private equity... More than other, more than under, more than other vehicles, investment vehicles, will tend to manage by numbers, by board meeting, and will have an over a style of governance that is typically dictated by the professions of the private equity individuals. And I come back to the lawyers, the accountants, and the bankers, who are very financially driven, very financially astute, very close to their forecasts, but aren't necessarily able to lead. A team of of individuals, okay, aren't, not, aren't necessarily be aren't necessarily going to be able to provide guidance and support, real managerial support for a CEO and their management team. So that is so, short term. Then I mean, as I'm thinking, as what you're describing, that style of private equity, we can send in some lawyers or accountants or financial folks. They can maybe unlock some quick value, but they don't really have the skill set to manage this organization. For the long run, because they don't really understand that underlying business and they can't empathize with the underlying business. Is that kind of the? the I, I think there's an element of financial engineering, um, and I'm very being I'm being I'm intentionally generalizing just to make a point. There's they're clearly not all like that. There's an element of financial engineering, mm -hmm. and the the profile of private equity uh, professionals is such that. They're not in a position like they don't have the experience to be able to support a CEO who comes to them and says, listen, I've got this problem with so-and-so and how do I deal with it? I see. So the, the, the private equity firms will not step in and manage a business themselves, as you know. They will leave that to management. And, and they're not even good board members, as your point. They're not, generally speaking, they're not even supporting the CEO or the executive team very well. Again, well, generally. The, the, the questions... I mean, of course, there are there are some, but the questions are generally one dimensional. How are you doing versus forecast? What does your pipeline look like? What's the conversion rate? You know, what is the gross margin? How are you driving EBITDA? Can we reduce the overheads? I, I've probably summarized about a two, two hour board meeting yeah. in the last 30 seconds, but that's the gist of all of the questions. Um, and it's OK. It's OK. But what I'm what I'm not advocating for to, for the removal of lawyers and bankers and accountants as private equity professionals, I'm just saying it would be cool to have more people from HR, uh, more people from tech, um, people from more more individuals from marketing or sales, just a bit more of a of a of a blended mix to reflect the reality of the employees who you're leading. Totally, yeah, and you know. Again, long term versus short term. If you're trying to unlock value on a particular timeline, there's a lot of um, a lot to be said for the discipline of profit margins, EBITDA, hitting your numbers, yeah. even pressure. There's a lot to be said for pressure, but 
ultimately yeah. t- to me, a sustainable business needs vision, you know, and that usually is a vision that transcends dollars and cents. It's actually usually something deeper that yes. might involve, it involves empathy and it's, it's, it's probably a totally different skills. It's, a t- it is a totally different skill set than financial engineering, right? If, cause, cause ultimately in my experience, you know, even folks who are very money driven, that doesn't sustain something for 10 years, 20 years that it's, I'm on to the next deal. I make my money and then I'm on to the next deal. Right. I agree with you, Andy. And, I, and there's an element of leadership that is missing. Leadership is always expected from the CEO, mm-hmm. but who's going to motivate him or her and who's going to give the, the management team something to look forward to beyond a sale in the next three to five years. And I'm 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 summarize, I'm intentionally being provocative to make a point, but it is the it is the overwhelming majority of, of private equity investments. They, they are the timeline ends up driving a lot of behaviors, not all of which are very healthy. So how is Parabellum different? I mean, obviously your your family office, you know, you're doing private equity investments or maybe venture capital, or I I don't know how you define it. You obviously look at it very differently. So so how are you doing things differently? Well, uh, firstly, it's my money. Secondly, I there is no so there's there's no external investors to answer to. Um, I've spent 15 years of my career in gainfully paid employment in operations, senior management, and op- roles. Mm-hmm. So, um, working. In, across most of the globe, other than Latin America. I generally tend to stick to sectors that I know well and have some expertise in. And um, there's no investment horizon, as I mentioned earlier. This is So it's not, it's not only my funds, but there's no obligation to sell at any given period of time. So it's a little bit it's a little bit of a combination between the private equity and the, and the, and the family office model in that I'm deploying my own funds. Private equity doesn't do that. I don't have an, an exit horizon, which is not a private equity type of transaction, but my appetite for risk is substantially higher than most of the family offices whose remit and mission is preserving wealth rather than gen- necessarily generating it. Or if they take a riskier investment, it will typically be reduced to 10 to 15% of the value of their total assets. And I, I've grown up in operations. I mean, my, my first three years, I was stuck in the desert in Australia on an oil rig and um I'll spare you the rest of my CV, but I feel I'm able to to give some guidance and support to the CEOs that that is meaningful. And I always I also feel as though if God forbid something happens uh, to a CEO or they don't perform, I, I'm able to take over the CEO role. It's not something I would I would do lightly. Uh, but my focus is on much more being able to constructively support the CEOs because there isn't a single CEO, including myself, um, that doesn't read that doesn't require a certain level of support. But more often than not, the chairmen and the non-exec uh, directors are more concerned about corporate governance and their own professional indemnity, both of which are important. But it's not how you're going to make money, no. and um, so so my model, I think, is is a mixture of both. And he, because it's because it's my own, because is there, there's no there's no investment horizon. Well, it, I I got to stop you there. I mean, so yep. much of this is interesting, but you're talking about you know focused on indemnification and all that stuff, it, it, and you know how you're different because you're more long term oriented. You're not taking OPM. I feel like a theme of what I'm hearing is different incentives, and this kind of goes back to me, the core of private equity. You know, maybe a private equity a normal deal comes in and the the private equity guys have a different incentive and that, that, you know, creates a morale problem or whatever. But also on the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of publicly traded companies that I don't think are being run well, that have a lot of incentive problems. What you're talking about, I'm coming in and investing in a company and there's actually a pretty good alignment of incentives because you're talking about something that's sustainable something that's long-term. And so if I'm an employee, you know, if you buy a, a, a series of ice cream parlors, ice cream shops, 
and I'm yep. working at the ice cream shop, you know, I'm scooping ice cream. At least I know if you walk in and you're the owner, you're not trying to sell this thing tomorrow. We're on the same team. We're both trying to operate this store and succeed over the long term. That's yep. already a huge, you know, it's it's a much different incentive that now I feel like we're on the same team rowing together versus we're at odds in a confrontational relationship. But you're also prepared to take, I'm also prepared to take commercial risks and I'm not ever at any point, nor have I ever tried to cover my backside. Mm. I'm not saying I'm perfect far from it, but there is too much. Look, uh, there's, there's been lots of corporate uh, catastrophes where things have imploded, which have subsequently driven higher levels of corporate governance. Yeah. But it needs to be applied with a dose of common sense. And more often than not, it's corporate governance and compliance that rules the day, especially in public companies, obviously. I understand why. But even to a certain extent in private investments, in, in many of the non-exec type directors that you were referring to earlier. So there's a there's a number of considerations and angles that I think are, are a little bit different once you've you've lived through mm. what a painful board, what a board meeting looks like in the public market. I was listed for for about a couple of years. Um, previously as a CEO and chairman. It's a very different environment to working alongside private equity. I know, I, I mean, it's funny. It's like, I, I haven't really been in the corporate world ever because I was an entrepreneur right out of college doing startups. Okay. It, to me, it's like unfathomable uh, almost that we have these large organizations with their board of directors as a bunch of people without skin in the game. Yep. You know, I'm just like, of course, that's going to create huge problems. Isn't that obvious? You know, so to me, if a private equity family, like just even having your own skin in the game, to me, it's already just better, immediately better. I agree with you. I, look, I think it's a super healthy approach that, uh, that you're taking, Andy, but not having skin in the game applies not only to the corporate sector, yeah, but it equally applies to the private equity industry because as you know, if they invest anything, it will typically be a token investment, certainly sub 5%, but typically around, around 1% or 2%. Mm. And the main incentive, other than fees, is the carry. And the carry is only realized upon exit. So, um, different disincentives. I see. You're, both, both of those models have different misalignment yeah, but, of incentives. But ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is um, notwithstanding the fees, which are just meant to be there to pay the bills. Um, for private equity professionals, work, individuals working in that industry, the only reasonably large payday they get is through a carry incentive, which yeah. is only crystallized when the asset is sold. So, and, and I and I don't like I don't like that treadmill, and I, I I it's not cool for it's not cool for employees. And I've had many clients with deals that I've done interview me at before acquisition or just on the cusp of, a, of announcing one asking am i a private equity person now I, I like to think i don't necessarily always not always i don't think i sound like one but more importantly they want to test whether or not this thing is going to get sold again in three or four years um but anyway that, that's the point we, we've talked about i think uh, that's no rami that's the point where you can say i've bought these other five portfolio companies here's yeah. their ceos or their minority owners or whatever go call them and ask them you know like i'm thinking of i'm thinking of warren buffett and berkshire hathaway where you know the guy bought furniture stores or candy companies or whatever in 1970 and he still owns the store yeah I, I, he's 50 a, he's years a, later you know he's a tremendous icon there's 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 no doubt so i think um yeah that i, I don't think i have anything to add to that point well is this let me ask you this. I mean, I, I think I agree. I, I, I guess on a very macro level, I yeah. love long-term thinking. Short-term value is okay. Like I have nothing against short-term value, unlocking value, buying a company, flipping it. It's not immoral. It's not evil. But to no. me, ultimately, it's not that exciting. To me, with the really exciting stuff builds huge long-term lasting value for everybody, right? Like think of like a Steve Jobs. He built an enormous fortune, but he also built value for, you know, all of us with our iPhones. Yeah. yeah. It, but that was long-term, right? That's not something that that's not a two or three year flip. 
So he was asked for many years, as you know. I mean, it was um, it, it was it's been a long journey for him. Sorry, Andy, I interrupted you. No, no, it's all. But what I'm wondering, it sounds to me, you know, you're taking, you know, you're you're you have a more diverse skill set than a lot of private equity professionals because you are so involved in the operational level. And so you're saying, you know, we need more professional diversity in private equity. That makes a lot of sense to me. But you also have a more buy and hold long-term mindset. You know, maybe eventually you exit some investments or whatever. But the point is you don't come in with a three to five year timeline. Is this something that can be scaled? I mean, obviously you're different. Do you think it's are there other, you know, folks in the industry? Are there other family offices? Are there other private equity professionals who are doing anything similar? I, I'm sure there are. I, I don't know them, but it's because I haven't taken the trouble of going out to meet them. Yeah. Um, there, there's some very obvious names that are obviously been hugely successful on a much larger scale. So uh, Martin Sorrell from WPP, I think, set up his own family office. Um, there are, there will no doubt be a number of entrepreneurs who've done very well with their own businesses, mm -hmm. and rather than have passive in, passive investment in in other funds, will decide to recycle their wealth into other deals. Type of deals may be different, um, but ultimately, one of the things that is in co is common with all entrepreneurs, as you know, is they don't like people telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. They all have a bunch of they all have a bunch of battle scars and they're not afraid of risk. And the fourth one is they all have sufficient self-belief that if it hits the fan, they'll find a way to solve the problem. And I think those four characteristics are probably very consistent with most entrepreneurs. Yeah. And so if they've made money, what you and I know, they're not going to want to sit and retire and, and plan their retirement or pension in Florida. They, they'll want to keep doing deals. It's so, so interesting. Sure there, are loads, there are loads of others like me out there who, who I'm sure will be have been more successful and have been doing things on a larger scale. You're you're totally right. I mean, I actually as you're talking through this, it kind of hit me. Um, I had a conversation with an entrepreneur that I've known for a long time. Yeah. And he's had he had four or five companies that he built and sold that were very nice exits. Maybe not yeah. quite uh, at your level, but still financially is very well off. And he's back to, you know, basically building something from the ground up. And I'm like, you know, why are you doing that? You have plenty of liquidity. Go buy something. And instead of building the first million in revenue, start at a million in revenue, you know, because it's like the first. But, but, it, but my point was to him was now you have the capital and you also have the entrepreneurial skill set and your your language, the battle scars. And I think maybe that is the answer here because with a, a lot of private equity funds, you have LPs. If they want a five-year hold, that's a constraint. If you're yeah. talking about a second or third generation running a family office, as you said, it's a totally different mindset. But it's not even the mindset. It's it, the second and third generation of a family office usually doesn't have the entrepreneurial skill set, right? It's the patriarch oh, or no. matriarch. So I wonder if it is this, you know, entrepreneurs who this is kind of maybe the second half of their career. And my my in my own career, I've built things and then sold them and then started over. And I've sort of slowly come to realize I like private equity and alternatives better because instead of, you know, starting over, starting from zero as an entrepreneur, you can combine your capital with your entrepreneurial skill set. It sounds like that's what you're doing just at a very high level. It, no, it, it is exactly what I'm doing, Annie, because I don't I have neither the re, the creativity nor the skills to start a business from scratch. That much I know. I also learned from my own corporate career that I was pretty good at running teams, uh, pretty good at running operations and a PL. So I ended up getting sent to all of the businesses that weren't performing. Um and that gave me the confidence ultimately to you know, save up a bit of money and do my my first deal. So like you, I, I would prefer to acquire something and help it grow on the basis that I'm starting from from a business that's already got a couple of million or a little bit of revenue rather than a, a, a standing start. But there are other individuals like your your friend who's obviously very talented and is able to start to, to, to you know, to start from nothing. But either way, there is a new, I think the point is there is, I think, a new breed of, 
investor or investment vehicle uh, that's that's rising and that's individuals like you and I and your friend who've made some money from from previous deals and who choose to reinvest it and they can then decide whether they they reinvested and play chairman to help the CEOs or whether they reinvested and take a very active role in those businesses but it is this breed where they're deploying their own funds they're comfortable with the risks that that entails uh, they know the sector they're investing into. Mm. They don't like anybody telling them what to do or when to sell. And they enjoy the journey because they they can connect with the people they're working with. Uh, it, I think it gives the, the 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 employees in the company someone to maybe not necessarily look up to, but uh, but at least someone who can inspire them. And you know we could all do with a bit more inspiration. Totally. Yeah. And this conversation I had with my friend, I mean, it's only relevant. I'm trying to talk him into a deal, right? Well, and that's why, you know, you're very interesting, you know, you know, the fact that you have a family office and you can do these deals independently. I mean, I think the fundamental problem for a lot of entrepreneurs, let's say you have a liquidity event, you know, and, and, you know, you, you make $10 million or 10 million pounds or 10 million euro or whatever, that's enough. You can do kind of a micro deal, right? But it's not enough that you're doing a big deal or or five deals or anything like that. Yeah. What do you think is sort of the minimum scale that a person, that an entrepreneur who's had had some liquidity events or maybe saved, accrued some savings? What's kind of that minimum scale where you would even consider it to be, you know, a true private equity acquisition? I mean, I, I kind of use the word micro private equity to describe some of this yeah. stuff. You know, it transaction less than 5 million, you know, deal size it's, to me, it's still private equity, but it's, it's, it is, it is. You, you know, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer, Randy. I think, you, you, let me paraphrase. The, the question is, what is the smallest deal size that would classify as private equity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And that would be, you know, hmm, that you're not just taking over as the entrepreneur, but that there's enough scale that you know you can sort of uh be above the entrepreneur you know or or you know where okay. there's enough scale that you don't feel like you have to come in directly and displace the ceo but rather you're an external resource and there's enough you know it's kind of like it needs to be a big enough sandbox for you to play in if there's only two employees and and 500,000 in annual revenue there's just not enough really for you to optimize right so it has to be a organization of a certain scale for, for yes. you to really enhance the value from what you do? The smaller the business, the harder it is to impact value. And and I, I that's that's a self-evident statement, but I'll, I'll make it regardless. Um, I have to think about this. I think in terms of... Well, I don't what's think the smallest, like what's the smallest deal you've ever sold? I guess that's really what I'm, or, you know, smallest deal rather that you've ever done with this model i guess that's really what i'm asking hey, like what's so kind of that entry point what i was going to say uh, andy is that actually the smallest deal i've ever done is for a dollar and that's because they were distressed businesses ah. so there was, there was no consideration up front because there were more liabilities than than yeah. uh, than assets but there was working capital that required an investment so, you know, there are businesses that were turning over seven or eight million pounds or dollars um, that I've acquired for a dollar because wow. there were so many liabilities that not only did it require significant restructure, um, but by definition also needed investment, whatever that investment might have been. So I don't think that the entry ticket is necessarily a determining factor. Precisely for those reasons, there's been there've been huge corporates that are in some instances they've they've gone bust. And I'm trying to think of a there's a very large retail chain in the, in the UK that was sold many years ago for a dollar, and they had uh, they had a couple of hundred million in revenues, but about 400 million in debt. So it's a little bit of an extreme example, but my point is the entry ticket isn't necessarily uh, the way to look at this. All other things being equal. Look, I don't think there's a lower limit to how you, you would call private equity because ultimately it's more about the exit than it is the entry point. It's what you do with that business. And if you start with a, I think if you if you have a, a, a company that's got less than 15 or 20, 20 employees, 
it, it feels like it's it, you're the entrepreneur, as you say. But I think anything from 20 employee on, employees onwards, you can have a, a CEO and be involved to support him or her as, as appropriate and help to develop the business. Um, so I think I, I'm hopefully that's answered your question. So I, I don't think there's a minimum ticket size. If, if you were to really press me hard on, on a, on a trading business that isn't bust, I was going to say five or 10 million, uh, Andy, but I, I don't think that's right because, um, it's much more about the exit and the value and the value that you can build in a business. There's no, there's no um, special league of, of saying, well, you know, I work in private equity. Any private transaction where you're taking an investment risk, a risk with your time, um, and you get to run your own show, I think is, is a private equity slash entrepreneurial gig. Totally. Yeah. And I, I've started using, and I, I didn't make it up, but I didn't coin this myself, but I've just started saying micro private equity where it's this sort of uh, gray area between it's not a passive investment, but yep. I'm not ta- I'm not taking over as the entrepreneur either. I'm there to support. And typically, the, you know, w- cool thing is if you make the right investment, you have the right skill set, you might be able to add just a tiny bit of your time, but in a way that's very value adding for them. And then typically, you know, you're investing at a much uh, more attractive multiple than if you go and buy a mutual fund or, you know, the, the multiples and yeah. public markets are crazy. So like all things considered, if you can afford the risk, and then especially if you can add value, yeah, I believe it's just a better form of investing just in terms of the returns. Do, would you agree with that? Maybe that's an obvious question, but would you agree no, with yeah, that? Of course, I, of course no, I know. I agree. You need to have a certain risk appetite because it's easy to buy a mutual fund mm-hmm. and you need to be willing to, to make the time and and clear enough headspace to be able to deal with it for, for many individuals. If they haven't had experience or haven't grown up as an entrepreneur, taking a direct position could be a bit scary. You know, you've got to, you've got to, there's a, the whole, the, there are a whole bunch of dimensions and concerns you've got with a CEO and a management team that you, you won't have if you, if you buy a, a financial instrument. Totally, totally. Well, I just, I, I actually love, you know, I did kind of press you and to your credit, you were, you know, you were willing to kind of attack it from some different angles. But I think the point was with private equity, you're not running a startup. You're not trying to build something from scratch. And yeah. you know, you kind of referenced 15 or 20 employees. It's not necessarily a dollar size of the deal, because there's some deals, a dollar, you reference a dollar deal size. But if there's 15 or 20 employees, um, again, it's a very rough proxy. It's inexact. But the point is. There's a big enough sandbox. There's enough there, there organizationally that someone with your ex- experience can come in and help to optimize and actually add value. And you do want to leverage that really over as much as you possibly can, right? Like that's a form of leverage or value yes. add that you're bringing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you start with 15 or 20 employees and um, you, you manage to get the business to be cash flow positive, and uh, you win a couple of contracts, you might be able to do another acquisition with your own funding, part of which may be self-generated by the business, to buy another business that does 10 or 15, that has 10 or 15 employees. Clearly, it's, it's, a, it's a much slower and much harder route than going out there and trying to raise a whole bunch of money. Uh, but the money won't be yours. You'll have a small minority stake. And... By default, you end up, end up becoming a glorified employee because you get to play with much bigger numbers. Commercially, I have to stay with bigger upside, but it's not your adventure anymore. You know, you're 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 deploying a lot of other people's monies, and you're constantly peddling influence rather than have the ability to say what happens. I love it. And, you know, it. And Rami, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and talking about this. And it's just, My pleasure. it's it's just great. You know. We talk about so many investments and including passive investments, you know, LP investments, but there's just so much entrepreneurship occurring in the world of private equity. And that's actually the piece that I love, you know, because I'm an entrepreneur that's come into private equity just almost by accident. And so to me, the approach that you're taking, the fact that it's different 
is probably the most appealing you know thing about it. So that being said, where can our audience go to learn more about Parabellum Investments or to to see more of your thought leadership? The yeah, I guess the, the website or my own personal website, Andy. I I'm I'm not yeah Parabelluminvestments.com, I guess is is the yeah is is the is the website. Or if they okay. if they if they search my name if if they're interested, I'm sure they've got better things to do. But in case they're very bored, no, I they don't. No, you know what? I I we're linking it in the show notes. But um, I'm you know I've been following some of your content as we were discussing before the call, and I think it's the fact that you're talking about it and talking about what you're doing. I think is so important because it just lets folks know that there are other options out there. There's other approaches. And so yeah. again, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your unique My pleasure. perspective. Thank you so much for your time. It's, it's, it's great to speak to you.